Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Solomon Stewart, Pastor Solomon Stewart, thank you for allowing me to teach today. It's been a pleasure writing this message. I know uh, the Lord's really been working on me, brother. Amen. And uh, on this church as well. It, he's been putting it on my heart about this church a lot. And you and I have talked about this. Yes, sir. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? Hope. Hope. Everybody knows the scripture. Everybody knows John 3, 16. But what are you doing about it? Today I'm broken hearted for the church. We're going to study the book of Philippians in the church of Philippi. And now I got started. And I wrote this message three weeks ago when, when the Holy Ghost woke me up in the middle of the nighttime and gave me this message. Word for word gave me this message. I knew I was going to preach about them. And I didn't even know Solomon was going to ask me to preach. And then the last couple of weeks, he put up John 3.16, or last week, he put John 3.16 on my heart and asked me, what are you doing about it, Ryan? Everybody knows this verse. But what are you doing about it individually? Let's go to word and prayer. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. I look forward to what you're going to do through me today, Lord God. I know that you've given me this message, Lord. I know the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. And it's a great feeling that I know where it came from. No part of me, Lord, wrote this message on myself, by myself. The wisdom that is from above, in the book of James it says it's first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy. And I know I've had all those assets. It was pure. The message was peaceable. It was gentle and very easy to write, Lord, because I know you've given it to me. And I thank you for the wisdom above, Lord. I thank you that we're allowed to use this wisdom, Lord. And I thank you for the teachings of this wisdom and how we know that it's from you. Father God, be with the congregation today, Lord. May you open their hearts and ears to the message that I've, that you've given me, Lord. I just was a scribe. Thank you again for this opportunity, Lord. Bless us now. In the great, powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Honestly, I don't even know if I'll get to my message today because the Lord has been just speaking to me. So if I veer off my message, that's the Lord, 100%. I have eight pages of notes, I think. I don't know if I'll get through them. Okay. So, here in Revelation Church, obviously we're a new church. We're still under a year old. But I must say that this is five years in the planning. Just three weeks ago, I think it was, two weeks ago, five years ago, we were at Lancaster Baptist Church, myself, Sarah, Leslie, and, and our pastor, Solomon. And the Lord put it on our heart to start Camp Revelation. And part of Camp Revelation was a church, Revelation Church. And I gotta admit, I gotta say, we're right where we need to be because that's God, he wants us there. Is a camp in the future? I want there to be. You know, I hope I'm not revealing too much, I don't know. <laughs> but my point is, we followed again the will of God and here we are today. Five years later, I'm preaching, teaching. I, this is going to be more of a teaching message. 
than a preaching message. But today we're going to go over the book of uh, Philippians, and we're going to study the church of Philippi. Before I get started, though, I have some questions that I want to work through with you guys. And feel free to answer. And I want you to be genuine and truthful. Um, I, I, want, I want the Holy Spirit, if you allow it, to flow in this room today. And hopefully I get through my message in a, a decent time. What is the purpose of the Christian church? Show Christ's love. To show Christ's love. To glorify God. To glorify God. To be unified as one body under the headship of Jesus Christ. To reach the lost. To reach the lost. I love it. What did you do this morning, Sarah? Please. To reach the lost. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and explain what happened this morning. Um, Try not to get crying okay, okay. so where we live there's a lot of homeless people or drug addicts and they can't handle the side of the off ramps never pay any attention to them but today there was a little girl uh, when i was going to get gas she had a big smile and just waved as i drove by so i don't know i got a little tug at my heart and got gas and went in and got donuts um, didn't know anybody else in the car. I just got grabbed two packages of donuts. And then when I went back to give them, I looked at my car and I had two just bottles of lemonade. And when I walked up to the car, there was a little girl, dirty, shirtless, and another little boy not much older than her. They were living in their van with their parents who obviously um, were in, in their addiction. And I, I told them I didn't have much, but I was willing to pray with them. And I prayed with the, the mom. The dad wanted nothing to do with it. And the kids, in just a couple minutes that I prayed with the mom, the kids finished the lemonade and the donuts. They were so hungry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was fun. That's the church. That's the church, right? That's the church. Sharing God's love, right? Yeah. yeah. Leslie said that. So how should we act in church, in a church, say, as a congregation together? How should we act? Unify. I'm sorry? Unify. Unify, right? Right. And unity, to make unity, it takes a lot. It takes a, we're gonna, I don't wanna to dig too much into my message right now, but it takes a lot to be unified. You know, if you have one bad apple, what happens to the rest of the bad apples? Okay. Let me ask this question. You don't have to raise your hand or say anything, but think about this. How many people have been hurt by the church? Okay. My point is that churches are far from perfect. Right. Life is complex, and generally people distrust most, pe most things that are organized and institutionalized. Do we trust the banks? Hmm. Organized and institutionalized, correct? Most people distrust that type of stuff, especially today. But we should not write off the church. And let me explain. I pulled up an article. It's kind of a lengthy article, but it has some very valid points in it. I want to read through it. And forgive me, I couldn't find who wrote it. So I'm just going to read the article. And because I couldn't find who wrote it, I could actually add some of my thoughts in it. Okay. Article states, or starts with, as trendy as the idea of writing off the church is, maybe, it may be a mistake. While writing off a church passes as sophisticated thinking, it's actually the opposite. What if it's simplistic and even reductionist line of thinking leads to nowhere constructive? People argue that the idea of the church isn't even biblical. I disagree. So let's start with this basis. First, if you're a Christian, church is not something you go in. It's something you are. Mm -hmm. You cannot dissociate from the church as a Christian any more than you can dissociate from humanity as a person. You don't go to church, you are the church. Second, the church was not a human invention. Half reading the New Testament with one eye closed you will lead the inescapable conclusion that the church was God's idea. 
In fact, most of the New Testament is not about the teachings of Jesus. It's about the work of the church that Jesus initiated and ordained. Yes. The writer, this writer says, I won't fill this post with scripture versus to prove my point. Because quite frankly, you'd have to get rid of the majority of the New Testament. To argue that the church was parenthetical, made up organization. If you want to get rid of the church, you would need to get rid of Jesus. You can't have one without the other. Side note, what's the world trying to do? Maybe, maybe what bothers you should actually amaze you. I understand the idea of the church being imperfect makes some people in despair. But rather than making us despair, the fact that Jesus started the church with imperfect people like us should make us marvel at God's grace. Incredible grace, that is. God uses ordinary, broken human beings as a vessel of his grace and delight in his offspring. I'm wearing sandals today, partly because I tried to walk on water yesterday and I fell out of the boat. And the other part is my shoes are somewhere in a box somewhere because we're moving. <laughs> Jesus wore sandals. Jesus wore sandals every day. He's proud of his grace beating through your imperfect redeemed life and through the church. The idea that God would use you and I is pretty amazing, actually. Remember, he is God and he had other options. He could have spoken the word directly from the heavens, like he did in some other instances. But he chose, instead he chose to use broken people like you and I. To showcase his grace, his word, in a world that is so desperately in need. In need of redemption. For sure, community is messy. People sin. Leadership sins. Most of the New Testament is not a story of an idealized church where everything worked perfectly all the time. Most of the New Testament is a story about Jesus using his followers to spread his love in spite of themselves as they overcome obstacles after obstacle. 819, August 8, or I'm sorry, August uh, 19th, 2018, the day after my daughter's wedding. My mom was 63 years old and she accepted Christ for the first time in the Journey Baptist Church. For 63 years, we prayed for her. My family prayed for her. For 63 years, people use, God used people like myself, Sarah, the rest of the church. But it was in the church where she accepted Christ. Sarah and I had a conversation with her the night before, or the week prior, or, or a couple days prior, where she asked, she asked Sarah and I, how we can live our lives like we do with all this stuff that we've been through in our past. Was, was that a God moment? Was God using Sarah and I the way he wanted for her to see? To open her heart 100%. And then the next day, she accepted Christ. So is this why Jesus uses us to overcome obstacles? The fact that Christ, Christ uses flawed people to accomplish his work on earth is actually a sign of his grace, not of his absence. The church's story, as twisted as it gets at times, is a beautiful story. God's amazing grace, God's power, and God's redemption. So by the way, is your life, which reflects the story of the church more than you would think. The church gives the world a front row seat to the grace of God. How about that? 
Another argument, the ultimate consumerism isn't going to church. It's walking away from it. People criticize the church today as being charismatic, consumer, consumeristic, I'm sorry. And to some extent, churches cater to consumerism often to their detriment. I agree that consumerism is a problem for Christianity. But ironically, much of the dialogue about the people, or I'm sorry, about the, why the people are done with church pushes them deeper into Christianity consumerism than it pushes them deeper into discipleship. Here I am, all alone, worshiping God on my schedule when it's convenient for me. Listen to, listening to the podcast of your favorite preacher, which I do as a side note, while you're at the gym or in the backyard, mowing the grass, pushing through your favorite worship songs through your earbuds, it doesn't make you a new passionate follower of Christ. It usually makes a less effective one. Anyone know anybody like this? Are they, they've been hurt by the church so they've cut it off, but they think they can do it on their own? We're going to work through this today. Disconnecting, your, disconnecting yourself from the community is actually less faithful than connecting yourself to a flawed community. If you, th if you think the church isn't enough and arguably, arguably we need to reform it, I'd say yes. Then do what the early Christians did. If you want a more biblical church, don't gather weekly. Gather daily. Get up before dawn. Pray together with other Christians. Before you go to work, pull your possessions. Don't claim anything as your own. Be willing to lose your job, your home, or your family like the disciples did. Or even live your life, because, or, or, or even your life because you follow Jesus. Then you will become more authentic. To pretend the church doesn't need to be more organized is as logical arguing that society doesn't need to be organized. Because community is, because community is inevitable, organization is inevitable. Our, our ability to organize and to accomplish more together than we can alone is one of the crowning achievements of community. This is something that God's given us. Our ability to work together makes Christian effort far more effective. Why did Jesus send out disciples two by two? The only one that wants us to believe that we are better off on ourselves is the enemy. If you really think about it, it's a very clever, clever tactic. The point is, as a church, we need to be together. Another argument, the church has helped even those who represent the church. Very few people come to know Jesus because he appears supernaturally to him and he calls him by their name. Does this ever happen? Yes. But 99.9% of, of the time it doesn't. Almost all of us who follow Jesus have changed lives. A flawed body. I'm sorry. Almost all, 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 almost all of us who follow Jesus have had our lives changed by a flawed body called the church. That Jesus so passionately loves and calls his own. Do we need more churches? Absolutely. Do we need more humble churches? Absolutely. Do we need more authentic, transparent leadership? Absolutely. Does the church need to change? Without a doubt. Solomon, hear this. The church needs continual reformation and transformation. So what would the future look like? We will gather in quite the way we do today in the future. In some ways, yes. 
Maybe. Maybe not. In some ways, no. Hopefully, we gather more frequently and work through our differences at a deeper understanding, impacting the communities more powerfully that surround us. But regardless of the church and how it gathers in the future, we should gather. We need to gather. We need each other, especially in times like today. We Christians need each other more than ever right now. Amen. And if you don't think you need other Christians, I promise you, you do. And so does the rest of the world. Now more than ever, the world needs Christians working together humbly under Christ to lead people into a growing relationship with him. In whatever innovate, fresh, innovate and fresh way from form that it takes. The church is not dead. It is far from it. Maybe it's just the beginning to take shape of a brand new era that we desperately need. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce you to Revelation Church. Here we have a great pastor, his loving wife and family. Here we have a great house where this church is taking place. Revelation cares for the Lord's people. Revelation Church is innovative. Revelation Church will do preaching and honoring God as we should. Revelation Church will follow all the Lord's commands. Revelation Church will go on loving like we always do and we're supposed to. We will be a good representative of how we should be as a church. The list goes on and on. Yes, we'll find ourselves short sometimes. There will be misunderstandings in the church. But the Lord is 100% behind it. And I can guarantee that. We need this church. And we need you to be part of this church. Solomon had no idea what I was preaching today. Not a clue. But this is what we need. Let's pray again. Father God, I would thank you again for this opportunity. I thank you for that quick story, Lord. I don't even know how much time I spent on it, Lord. It doesn't matter. It needed to be said, Lord. Father God, as I dive into the second portion of this message on the church of Philippi, we guard our hearts, or guide our hearts, Lord. Again, I pray for this congregation that our hearts and ears are open to receive this message. And let us make mind choices of how you want us to be, Lord. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that's in this room, Lord. And I thank you for what you're doing. You're an amazing God, and I love you. In your son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I got two spots to turn our Bibles to. I don't even know what time it is. What time are you about? 1040. Oh, man. Buckle up. I got to take my flip-flops off. <laughs> I'm serious. I have two spots we want to look at this morning, briefly. The Church of Philippi, uh, Philippi, Philippi. So go ahead and get your Bibles ready in Philippians chapter 1. Amen. Thank you, Solomon. And now we're going to look at the start of the church of Philippi. It's in Acts 16. So I'll get in turn there. Actually, while you're turning to Acts 16, I should turn there too. Acts 16, 6 through 8 is what we're going to look at. Paul's Macedonian vision. Remember the vision I was talking about? God it has God gave anybody a vision in this room. You can raise your hand. I know there's more than you do. I hope there's more than you do. God's given me a vision. God's given me the wisdom. Here we have Paul, the Apostle Paul, in his, his Mesopotamian vision. Starting at verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone throughout the Paraguay, 
and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Is that wisdom from above right there? Forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach in Asia. After they, or after they were come to Messiah, they say to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Meaning the Spirit wasn't going to allow them to go in. And they passing by Messiah came down to Torres. And uh oh, verse 9 says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Another vision. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. It's just kind of like the, the vision that God gave me three weeks ago to preach this message. I, I think it is. And after he had seen this vision, immediately, immediately it says, we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. What's the great commission? Go and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Prior to preach the gospel, it says, I am with you always. It's Matthew 28. I think it's verse 26. I don't know. It's the last two verses of, 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 of Matthew 28. It says, Jesus said, I am with you always. Go and preach the gospel. Nothing can shut you down, Ryan Woody. Nothing can shut you down, Solomon Stewart. Nothing can shut you down, Dion. Go and preach the gospel, Stacy. Nobody can shut you down. I'm getting off my notes. <laughs> sorry. So the background, I'm sorry. Let me let me finish reading. Where did I leave off? I'm getting excited. Verse 11. Verse 11. Lydia, okay, says, uh, verse 11 says, Therefore, loosening for Torres, we came straight course to, oh man, Samantha Sia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi. This is the start of the Philippian church right here. It says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony, and where the city is abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, here we go, here's important, this is important, and on the Sabbath, we went out to the city by the riverside where prayer was wont and, and uh, was wont to be made and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, which, let me stop for a second. People were selling stuff back in the day. Okay. Was this something God really wanted? Like they're trying to do it on their own, okay? It says, and a seller of purple, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a seller of purple of the city of Telithria, which worship God heard us. So this lady heard, whose heart the Lord had opened, and that she attended unto things which were spoken of by Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, if, there, if, if you have judged me to be faithful of the Lord, come into the house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, verse 16 says, And it came to pass, as they went to the prayer, as, as they went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain and soothsaying. I think we could stop there. What had happened right here? Did the Great Commission get fulfilled? How so? He preached and taught her and then she got baptized for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And right there on that riverbank, the church of Philippi was, was built. Right there because a woman had received the gospel and she was baptized right there. Now, let's back up. A couple, couple around six, verse six. What had happened? They were given a vision, remember, to go do this. 
And look at the result. Was that Paul was being a faithful servant at that time. Okay. At here in Rome, eventually later he got sent to prison. Apostle Paul wrote this book of Philippians, which we're going to cover. Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians in prison. He was there for two years for preaching the gospel. Again, the church was started on the riverbanks right here. I guess you turn to the books of Philippians, the Bible of Philippians. Philippians, we're going to start with uh, verse 127 and we're going to read through 218. Philippians verse 1 and 27 starts and says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent. I may hear of your fear affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, strive together for the faith of the gospel. What is this right here? The church. What's that? It's the church. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same affliction which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Chapter 2 starts with, if there, be, if, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in all lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other than better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross of the cross. Wherefore God also High, hath highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of the things of heaven and the things of earth and the things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the God, the Father. Verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which work within you both to, do, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Hello, United States of America, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Ye, and I, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. What is the purpose? To be a one accord, right? 
Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. Verse 10 says, if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath no one to help him up. Verse 11 says, again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one, verse 12, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. This isn't in my notes, but I'm not going to get into great detail, but I saved the Marine's life in cold weather training because he was, well, he wasn't alone because I was there with him, but he needed my body heat. He was full-blown hypothermia. And I'm, it's training so I can talk about it, but I had to get in the sleeping bag with this Marine. And when they found us, they were yelling at me, do not let him go. I was hugging him as, 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 as hard as I could. And he needed my chest body heat. And they put us in a medevac and got us to the hospital. Then I could release him. But if it wasn't for my heat, he would have died. Okay. We need each other. We can accomplish many things if we are together with one accord. Look at verse 15. It says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of rebuke. The sons of God, I'm sorry. If we hold each other accountable against all evil, we can be blameless. Solomon Stewart's my accountability partner. He's going to keep me blameless. I do the same. It's very important that we hold each other accountable. It says the sons of God without rebuke. We as believers are to be straight models for our lives that are distorted by the failure to understand God's and His Word. We are highly visible examples of integrity. Okay? We need to be without rebuke because we are highly, we're, we're examples for other people to see. Okay? This is part of the reason my mother was saved. You know, I wasn't a knucklehead. I could have been running the streets. At, at a time, I was. But now I'm living for Christ without rebuke. And she saw it. Anybody else, the rest of my family, were running the streets still acting like fools. Some of them are still today. Okay. It says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse, perverse nation. There we go again. Where are we at today? How crooked is this place? We need each other to hold each other accountable. Okay. Because... It's perverse. It's a perverse. We could absolutely walk sideways right now. It's portrayed so much to us. It's like, come here, come here. It's like a kid Halloween candy. A mom who you shine as lights in the world. There it is again. We're shining as lights in the world for people to see. Christian unity results when individuals develop the mind of Christ. In more difficult situations, the church collectively solves problems through the involvement of church leadership. Okay? And I can tell you as a deacon in this church and a, and a deacon in the Journey Baptist Church, it's not one way or the highway. This is a community leadership where all thoughts are input. Okay? And that's important to have. The leadership can settle the problems that the general congregation cannot. Some problems we don't want. I said we. I shouldn't say we. Some problems the general congregation shouldn't know about. Okay. For instance, if somebody needed food, the church could step in as its leadership and take care of this problem without the rest of the congregation knowing because for whomever didn't want the congregation to know. Everybody understand the example? The leadership can take care of those problems. 
So leadership is absolutely necessary in the church. In the end, harmony, joy, and peace characterize the church that functions as it should. Harmony, joy, and peace. What is that? That's Jesus. Harmony, joy, and peace. Point number two. The church, the Christian church, gives us freedom from legalism. From legalism. Good night. Sorry, guys. I say it like four pages ago. If I don't finish, that's okay. I'll preach again. Not an actual film. Let's look at Philippians 3, verses 2 through 21. Okay, uh, Philippians 3, verses 2 through 21. It says, uh, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of consciences. Conscience I can't even say that word right now. Concision. There you go. Thank you, Leslie. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. It says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man think of that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. This is Apostle Paul. Says he, he goes, he goes, I'm circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching laws of a Pharisee, concerning zeal, prosecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. Here, but check this out. Verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost. Let me stop there. The Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, used to be a rock star. He was the one on the billboards, okay? Where did I hear that from? Can't, I can't think of it right now, but the Apostle Paul, okay? I'm sorry. Saul, before the road to Damascus, was the one on the billboards. He he says, I'm the tribe of tribes. I know everything. I went to the school. I know all the laws. I know the regulations. Matter of fact, I used to persecute people. I'm a, I'm, I was a Christian killer, okay? And then on the road to Damascus, you said, Boy! No, you're not. Now you're the Apostle Paul. Okay, man, I'm getting fired up. Now look at him. He says, verse 7 says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Verse 8 says, Yet ye doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine or own righteousness. What is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ Jesus, or I'm sorry, faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after it, that I may apprehend that from which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13 says, Brethren, I count my, not myself to the apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me. I says, I forgot that stuff. I'm not on the billboards no more. And reaching forth unto those which are before, I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling of Christ in Christ Jesus, God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it even unto you. Basically, if you're not on the right mind, God's going to reveal it to you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by in the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. It says, Brethren, be fellow, followers together of me, and mark them which also ye have for us an example. For many walk, in whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of God. For whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly, and whose glory is in the shame, who mind earthly things. Hello, United States of America. For our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, and it may be fashioned like unto the glorious body, according to the working hereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 
verses 2 through 7, the Apostle Paul was awesome by the world standards again, okay? There was no, back when he was Saul, he was awesome by, and a matter of fact, when he's Apostle Paul, he's awesome by the world standard too. But when he was Saul, when he, when he was Saul, he knew everything, okay? He went to the schools. He, he, he did all these miraculous things. As he was trained up in the way the child should go, okay? He, 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 he persecuted Christians for breaking the law and so on and so on. Uh, verse 8, he said he counted all things stuff, uh, all the stuff dumb. Brethren, I count myself not to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, this is verse 13, forgetting those that were behind and reaching forth unto which are before. And I didn't do it this morning, but I so want to do it. Maybe next time I preach. I wanted to bring honey buns for everybody to grab and just start eating at this point right now because you should. Not necessarily honey bun, but you're at a church. And I understand we need to keep this place clean and we shouldn't drink coffee in the foyer and, and stuff like that. But we're at a church. We're, we're at a church where we learn. Who cares if you eat a honey bun in the church? Amen. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Sorry, Dean, I'm looking at your hair that it's purple. Amen. Right. What has that got to do with church? Nothing. Amen. Not a thing. What's important, ladies and gentlemen, right here, study the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Portray the image of Jesus Christ like He wants us to. It says, go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I am with you, by the way. Who cares if I, I'm, I'm shoeless right now preaching the Word of God. Okay? That's what's important. This, this, you understand that? Amen. Remember the article? People distrust organized, organized fashions. People distrust. How come these people aren't beating the door down to get in here? Is it because we have church behind Revelation? People distrust organized institutions. Especially in a church. Point number three. The church is to teach salvation through Christ and nothing else. Who can quote John 3.16? What does it say, Paige? For God. How old are you? Eleven. Eleven. That's what I thought. I didn't want to. I didn't want to mess it up. Eleven-year-old can quote John three sixteen. My point is, everybody knows the scriptures. Most everybody knows the scriptures. Okay. What are we doing about it? We all know how to live by the scriptures, but are you living by it? Right. We all know that we are the church and we are the bodies of the church. But are you acting as you should? We as a church need to be able to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. His life, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what's important. Whether we present it in the house, in this house, at the grocery store, Stated Brothers, I love that place. <laughs> Or to La Quinta Park or Miles Park. But La Miles Park, I'm just going to tell you, has been on my heart. I need to spend some time at Miles Park. Even though I'm out there by myself, I'll talk to somebody about it, Christ. We must be looking for, looking for ways, and here's the kicker, and following the ways, sorry, <laughs> and following what the Lord puts on our heart, okay? We got to look for it, and then we need to follow what the Lord puts on our heart. Right. Remember Lydia from Philippi? She heard Apostle Paul preaching and praying. She heard. Said the Bible says she heard. 
of preaching and praying. There on the banks of that lonely river, she heard. She met Jesus Christ right there, was baptized. And right there, because she heard, the church of Philippi was born. Point four. The Christian church is supposed to teach good stewardship. Turn with me to verses, uh, or, I'm sorry, chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 10 through 18 quickly. I'm sorry, I'm way over time. But let the Lord work. Verse, uh, chapter 4, 10 through 18 says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care of me hath flourished again. <clears throat> Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. This is the Apostle Paul in prison. He says, I don't have any want. I've learned to be content. Which, by the way, this is why I'm reading part of this. I didn't add this part of my notes, but I'll just blurt it out there. Apostle Paul had to pay, he was in house arrest. He had to pay some kind of fee to live in the house, rent. Okay? So what, what I'm going to read here is the church of Philippi knew this and they would send him offerings or money to help pay for furtherance of the gospel. Do you understand that? Okay, so it says, uh, uh, it said, verse 11, again it says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to be abound, to abound. Everywhere and in full things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things, says I can do all things which uh, through Christ which strengthen me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye do communi communicate with my affection. Now ye Philipp Philippians know, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but only ye, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once again, once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire a fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received Epiditus, the things which were sent from you. So they sent Aphrodite to the Apostle Paul with the gifts, money, food, whatever he needed. An odor of sweet smell as a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Okay. So again, the Philippian church knew that Apostle Paul was in Rome in prison. And they sent to him multiple times in Thessalonica and you know, uh, t -t 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 where, where was that? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But the church sent to Apostle Paul. It's a, Apostle Paul thanked the believers for their financial support and help through the trusted servant Ephroditus. Their generosity encouraged Paul at the same time a personal need and taught him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. That was probably the blessing that came out of that. We also see that the church of Philippi had reached a maturity regarding its material possessions within the scripture. Okay, they had, so they gave. Did they have a lot? I've studied and it says no. But they gave a little bit, which helped furtherance of the gospel through Apostle Paul. He wrote the four books in prison, probably because they helped. The church knew how to give. Doesn't the Bible say something about it's better to give than receive? Anybody have a story about giving? My point is that if, that if we realize that Christ is the center of our lives, we also realize that this is all we need. The Christian church is supposed to teach us. Revelation Church will teach us. And the last point, the Christian church is supposed to teach us how to imitate Christ in our lives. Let me look at, uh, go back to chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 20 through 24 real right? quick. One, again, it's 20 through 24. 
Apostle Paul writes, according to my earnest expectations and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I want not. Verse 23 says, For I am straight betwixt the two, having desired to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Okay. The Apostle Paul knew that if I live as I wrote these books in prison, that's more needful for you. If Christ calls me home, I want to go home. But until I live, until he does that, and I live on this earth, that's why we're here. That's why my mother got saved. That's why we changed lives. That's why Sarah stopped and prayed this morning with those people. Because we're supposed to live for Christ and emulate Christ so they can see Christ through us. That's the point of life. And don't you ever forget that. Right. Revelation Church is here to stay. And we're small now. But like that tree that I planted out front, or that Solomon planted out front the, from the ladies retreat, that tree is doubled in size. It had to take root, okay? We're taking root right now. But with the right nurturing, that tree is doubled in size. It's huge. I was looking at it this morning. That was from the Lord. Amen, church family? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, this day and waking us up, Lord. I know this message was no part of me, but only you, Lord. And I know that it was heard today, Lord. I ask that you work in all of our lives, Lord. We sung that song, It Is Well With My Soul, this morning. And I pray that this message is well with the congregation's soul, Lord. I pray that as we leave this door today, you continue to protect us and be the great God that you are, the Almighty, the one and true God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Protect us, Lord, like you always do. Wake us up for another day. We'll stay here as long as you want, Lord. Continue to glorify and honor you. Bless us now as we all depart from here, Lord. Thanks again for this day. Thanks again for everything you do in our lives. Thank you for your son who died on our cross. It's in his name, Jesus, that I pray this message. Amen.